Life is built up of memories. Moments of time that are permanently frozen in your mind. Some of my earliest memories are of my grandmother, Romia Anderson, a mother who immigrated to America with a heart full of desire for the American dream. From a very young age, she shared with me her love for gardening, food, God, and what it means to be a person that is honest and genuine. But on February 8th, 2007, the woman who made such a large impact in my life died of cancer. To me, she played a large part in making me who I am today. But in the eyes of American society, she was simply part of a statistic one of the over 500,000 people who were expected to die from cancer in 2007. Over 2,000 deaths more than in 2006, and almost 50,000 deaths less than in 2019. For as long as we can remember, cancer has been something prevalent in our world. But why is this disease still so common? We are here today for the purpose of signing the Cancer Act of 1971. After almost five decades since Nixon declared war on cancer, we've seen some of the biggest discoveries in cancer research and treatment. But still, cancer plays a large part in just about every life in America. And yet it seems like we are so far away from finding a cure. I was an adult when he passed. However, you still feel like an orphan when you lose your parent. Solutions in cancer treatment rely on discoveries in cancer research. But doctors and researchers both agree that outside of cancer treatment, the biggest solution to lower our ever-increasing cancer deaths lies in prevention. Studies show that by just applying a preventative lifestyle in the way we live and eat, we can dramatically shift this deadly cancer trend. Can this be the change we've been looking for? The United States of America, home of great sports, gigantic landmarks, gargantuan cities, and a nation with one of the highest cancer rates in our world today. In fact, according to the American Cancer Society, over 1,600 people are expected to die from cancer today. For years, people have lived in fear of cancer, many connecting cancer with pain and an untimely death. Cancer. Cancer. It can start, they say, almost unnoticeably. And then it grows and grows a horror that never stops. Is it contagious? Marie Curie, the first woman to win a Nobel Peace Prize, said something extremely profound about fear. She said, Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more, so that we may fear less. 
fear of something stems from the unknown. With our ever-growing fear of cancer, do we really understand what cancer is? What is cancer? I just see cancer as a uh, loss of regulatory control. Human cells and the organisms are very complex organisms, and they work through a highly integrated network of regulation. And when you, as we get older, especially, those regulatory controls break down. And one manifestation of that is cancer. Cancer is basically cells that have a DNA damage. They've gone rogue. They've escaped the vigilance of the immune system. And they've created their own little community. Cancer cells are really smart. You know, number one, they stop communicating with other healthy cells. Number two is that they create their own blood flow so they can gain all kinds of nutrients. Number three, they create an enzyme called nagalase that actually puts your immune system to sleep. And number four, they secrete a protein called survivin that keeps them from going through the natural cycle of birth through death. So they escape death. They're resistive to death. See, a lot of people think cancer is a disease of whatever organ or tissue that's being affected. So if they have prostate cancer, they think it's a problem with the prostate. If it's breast cancer, a problem with the breast. But really, it's an immune system issue. And so naturally, our body always, we're always producing abnormal cells. Every single day, it's a product of metabolism. This is part of every single one of us, our, our normal physiology. So we're all developing these abnormal cells. However, our immune system naturally hunts them out and destroys them before they are able to grow out of control. However, somebody that has cancer, their immune system is weakened and their immune system is unable to identify these abnormal growths. And so over time, the abnormal growths are able to grow and grow and grow without being checked. And so over time, the, the tumor size gets larger and larger and larger until finally it starts to really fully disrupt physiology to where they may have symptoms, they may notice certain growths, Certain uh, blood tests may, may show elevated uh, biomarkers. Um, you may be able to see it on a, something like a mammogram or something like that or an x-ray. Um, but that's you know, literally uh, 10 to 15 years down the road of development at, at a minimum. So cancer is really an immune deficiency that's been going on for an extended period of time and it's allowed these abnormal growths to grow and expand unchecked. Abnormal cells are normal in the body, but when abnormal cells are created, the body works in an organized and controlled way to get rid of those cells. Sometimes, mostly as we age, our defense breaks down, and these abnormal cancer cells can grow. But cancer isn't anything new. It started centuries ago, before cancer was even a commonly used word. The oldest known recorded description of cancer was recorded in an ancient Egyptian papyrus that dates back to as early as around 3000 BC. The origin of the word cancer is credited to Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine and its use dates back to somewhere between 460 and 370 BC. But it wasn't until around 28 to 50 BC that the Roman physician Celsus translated the original term from the Greek into the Latin word we call it today, cancer. Around 130 AD, Galen, a physician in Rome, used the word onchos, meaning swelling, to describe cancerous tumors. In 1829, Joseph Reckheimer recognized the spread of cancer and called it metastasis. In the year 1838, Johannes Müller, a German pathologist, stated that cancer 
is made up of cells. In 1964, the U.S. Surgeon General's report estimated an undeniable link between smoking and cancer. In 1971, President Nixon declared war on cancer. Today, almost 50 years later, researchers are still making discoveries, but our cancer rate is still going up. Since 2016, one out of two men and one out of three women will have cancer in their lifetime. And rates are expected to increase by 2030. To understand the cancer increase today, we must first take a look at the growth of cancer from a period of time when recorded cancer rates were at its lowest. During the early 20th century, recorded deaths from cancer were low. In fact, cancer together with heart disease accounted for only about 18% of the causes of death in America. The leading causes of death were infectious diseases, such as tuberculosis, influenza, or pneumonia. But after the majority of these leading causes of death were being treated with the use of vaccines, and as America moved into the middle of the 20th century, we see a large growth in the cancer rates in the United States. This had a lot to do with the changes in life expectancy. With infectious diseases being the leading cause of death, many Americans only lived to be around 48 in the early 1900s. But by the mid-1900s, the life expectancy increased with the treatments of infectious diseases to around 71 years. Because cancer is an older age disease, the change in our life expectancy played a huge role in the increase of cancer. But there were two other changes that increased cancer rates in the United States. The first and most noted change was the change in the American lifestyle. In the late 1800s, and early 1900s, very few American families lived in cities. In fact, the majority of American families lived on farms. Each member of the family would work together, doing different duties all needed for day-to-day -day life, including farming their own food and bartering with their neighbors. As American society moved from rural farm life into the cities toward the approach of the mid-20th century, the diet wasn't based on what they could grow or barter. The American diet was based almost entirely on convenience. Following World War II, families no longer were limited on eating what they could grow, hunt, or barter. Families now bought what they ate Men and women lean more towards easy-to-make meals that were cost-efficient. TV dinners, hot dogs, and hamburgers flooded the American diet. And over 40 years later, these changes still affect us today. The foods that God provides, that nature provides, are very anti-carcinogenic. They're very health-promoting. They're very healing. Uh, these man-altered foods, this new class of foods that have been developed within the last hundred years or so, uh, are pro-cancer. They are pro-disease.
Our diet plays a large part in our connection with cancer today. What we eat makes up our cells that make up us. The American diet is full of additives that give it the flavors and tastes we love. One of the most addictive additives is sugar. And it can be found in most of what we eat today. The American Heart Association breaks sugar down into two different types, natural sugars and added sugars. Natural sugars can be found in two forms, fructose, which are sugars found in fruits, and lactose, which are natural sugars found in milk. Natural sugars are important because they provide essential nutrients that keep the body healthy and prevent disease. But added sugars don't share the same benefits. Added sugars are sugars that are added to foods and drinks while they are being made. Originally, the sugar is found in sugarcane or sugar beets, are extracted, and then used to create either table sugar, which we use to sweeten items like coffee, tea, and cereal, or food manufacturers use those sugars to add flavor to foods and beverages, including crackers, flavored yogurt, ice cream, and even salad dressing. The body metabolizes the sugar in fruit and milk differently than how it metabolizes sugar added to processed foods. The fiber in fruit slows down metabolism as fruit in the gut expands to make you feel full. Added sugars are digested quickly, which makes you not feel full even after eating. Many items that we eat every day are loaded with added sugars. And that was a king, my friend, and you were living in I, you and I were living in that kingdom. And he had thousands of subjects, millions of subjects. And every day he gets up and ordered 10,000 of his subject to be put to death. And you were one of those subjects. I'm one of those subjects. And I could not get out of that kingdom. I cannot escape. And so we know this man, he's killing thousands of his subjects every day. What would you think about that king? You think that guy is, 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 is sane? You think that guy is helpful or you think he's lost his mind? He lost his mind. So what would you do? Some people would find a way to get rid of the king. You see? So here's the conclusion of this. Every day, you and I, we are kings of this kingdom. And we have subjects. That's our immune system, our white blood cell, because they defend the kingdom. Can you imagine this king killing all his subjects, basically, every, most of all his subjects? It's going to weaken the kingdom. And when there's an invasion, he does not have enough subject, soldier to fight. So every day, whether it's ignorantly or consciously, we created a predisposition for cancer to thrive because we are killing our subjects. The white blood cells, the sugar. You see, cancer cells like sugar. Fructose is a form of sugar in which uh, is tumor cells have a preference for fructose. Uh, 
that's their preferred form of fuel. The prevalence of high fructose corn syrup in our foods, um, in processed foods specifically, uh, is rather concerning to me. There is no question that we live in a toxic world. The International Agency for Research on Cancer, a part of the World Health Organization, have evaluated over 900 likely cancer-causing chemicals in the past 30 years. Out of those over 900 chemicals, they have found 100 cancer-causing chemicals and several hundred others that are classified as probably or possibly cancer-causing in humans. Similar research has been conducted by the EPA and the NTP. These cancer-causing chemicals, also called carcinogens, include toxicants like tobacco smoke, exon gamma rays, and aflatoxins. But many of these carcinogens aren't just found in our outdoor environment. Many of these carcinogens can be found in our homes, in products we use every day. One day, we collected a sample of blood from each of these 10 Americans, and we sent it to a laboratory to analyze it for 413 different toxic chemical pollutants, pesticides and industrial chemicals alike. Of course, scientists have been studying pollution in air, in water, and land for decades. But it's only recently that they turned to the study of pollution in people. And that's what this project was designed also to do. There are hundreds and hundreds of toxic chemicals in the air in the United States, hundreds of millions of pounds emitted each year. But we know for a fact that none of these 10 Americans were exposed to these chemicals by virtue of the air that they breathed, even though we found some of these very chemicals in these 10 people. Could also have been the water that they drank, and believe it or not, some drinking water does start off looking like this before it's treated. But we know for a fact it wasn't the tap water. Of course, it could have been food that was the route of exposure, but we know for a fact that none of these 10 Americans were exposed to the chemicals we found in them as a result of food that they bought at the grocery store, bought at a restaurant, and consumed. That was not the source. What about personal care products? Our online survey has shown that women use an average of about 12 personal care products a day, and that exposes them to more than 160 chemical ingredients, some of them rather toxic, day after day after day. Men, the exposure is about half that because they only use about half of the personal care products that women use. But uh, some good news, this is not a gloom and doom presentation altogether. Um, almost all of the men were found to use both deodorant and toothpaste. <laughs> so so there's, there's kind of a silver lining there. These 10 Americans weren't farm workers, they weren't factory workers. And when the results came back from the laboratory, we had found 287 chemicals in just those 10 people. An average of 200 chemicals in each one. When you look at the chemicals by category, it's kind of astonishing. 28 different waste byproducts, dioxins, furans, things that come out of incinerators, smokestacks, 47 different consumer product ingredients, the flame retardants in these lights and this projector, Teflon chemicals, Scotchgard chemicals, pesticides. But for my money, most disturbing of all, we found 212 industrial chemicals and pesticide breakdown products that had been banned 30 years before we took those blood samples and sent them to the lab in 2004. 
Who were these 10 Americans? How were they exposed? Well, the truth of the matter is we don't really know very much about these 10 people. About the only thing we know is that as the exposures took place, all of them looked something like this. This was the first time anyone had ever bothered since the beginning of the chemical revolution to examine umbilical cord blood to see how many toxic chemicals got through to the developing child. Here's another view. This baby is receiving about 300 quarts of blood circulating to him from the mother every day. The nutrients that are allowing the baby to grow, the oxygen that's allowing the baby to breathe. This baby, like all babies at that age, does not have a blood-brain barrier. That means that the tissues of the brain, the cells of the brain, are not protected as they will be in later life, just a few months from now, really, to protect him from the chemicals that would pass into those tissues in those cells. So this baby, arguably, has been at his most vulnerable for nine months at this stage. And the other thing to know about this baby, this is my baby. This is Callahan Cook, my son, who was born a year ago. Pediatricians and scientists thought, hoped, that babies were protected from toxic chemicals because the chemicals were filtered out by the placenta. Our study showed, disturbingly, that that's not the case. Industrial pollution begins in the womb. Cancer is something that transforms your used to be normal to a new normal. That's how I would put it in my words. Um, so for kids who are diagnosed, I would say they go from knowing their friends in classrooms and being able to play on the playground to all of a sudden knowing their medications by heart and knowing their doctor's names and having to go to the clinic every week. So it's a, it's a new normal for sure. A lot of adults, they have established lives, they have families, that sort of thing. So with a diagnosis, mentally they can prepare themselves, emotionally they can prepare themselves even though it is a hardship. Um, they kind of have that foundation of being an adult and having a diagnosis. But as a child, you don't really have that as much. And it definitely depends on if you're young, if it's a baby or if it's a adolescent or a young adult. Um, but I would say it affects you differently based on how old you are, for sure. But wide spectrum, wide spectrum. When I was nine years old, I was diagnosed with synovial sarcoma, um, which is a pretty rare soft tissue sarcoma. Um, and it was in my abdomen and it had actually latched on to one of my kidneys. So fortunately, I have wonderful parents who knew something was up with me, even though I didn't really have that many symptoms at the time. Um, so they took me to my pediatrician and my pediatrician said, you need to get to the emergency room ASAP. So went to the emergency room and that's where my journey with cancer started. They caught it early, fortunately, and then I had a few rounds of chemotherapy, and then I had a major surgery, and I've been cancer-free ever since. But in that process, I found Camp Sunshine. I am the executive director of Camp Sunshine, and Camp Sunshine provides uh, experiences for children with cancer and their families. We started our first summer camp in 1983, and we started out just as a camp for children with cancer, and we had about 38 children and a handful of volunteers that very first summer. And that was our plan, to give kids with cancer one week where they could just be normal kids and go to summer camp and has really grown over the last 32 years to be a year-round program, just enriching the lives of children with cancer and their families. And we do not only summer camp, but recreational programs and 
support and educational programs throughout the year. Children with cancer and their families need some type of support. They need a connection to a community that understands what they're going through, not just for one week in the summer, but they need it year round. They need it as soon as they hear the word, your child, the words, your child has cancer. They need to know that they're not alone in this journey, that other people can help them, that other people have gone through this before. And um, what better way to know that than to be connected with other families? So I think what Camp Sunshine helps children and families realize is that, that it's not so scary. They're not alone, they're not isolated. Kids realize they can be a child, they can be a kid, even in spite of the face of cancer. That, that cancer can take a lot away from them, that they can't take that away. They can't take their hope, their um, childhood away. And Camp Sunshine is able to give that back. That's what I hear from families. They say, um, you know, you helped give me my child back. And that is something valuable. And families will say to me, you gave them something I couldn't. Camp Sunshine gave them something I couldn't. And so I think that's the impact. I think it gives them strength. We hope it gives them um, courage and, and, and optimism and, and hope. Hope that there's a future. Hope that um, cancer can't take a lot of things away. That, that those are things that, um, that they thought were gone from them, but they can get back. And I do hear kids say to me that chemotherapy might have healed their body, but Camp Sunshine healed their soul. And that's, that's something that's hard to measure. When we think about cancer, we tend to think about it as one disease. But there is not one type of cancer, but more than a hundred. Types of cancer are usually named from the organs or tissues where the cancers form. For example, lung cancer starts in the cells of the lung, and brain cancer typically starts in the cells of the brain. Cancer can also be described by the type of cells that form them, like carcinoma or a sarcoma. With so many different types of cancer, there are a wide variety of ways that they can be treated. The three most common forms of cancer treatment are surgery, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy. Surgery is used to prevent, diagnose, stage, and treat cancer. Typically today, the process of cancer surgery begins with a biopsy. This is done for most types of cancer. Here, part of tissue or a sample of cells is cut out of the body so that it can be analyzed in a laboratory to understand the stage in which the cancer has progressed. Outside of diagnosing cancer, some other ways that surgery is used is in curative surgery. When cancer is found in only one part of the body, and it's likely that all of the cancer can be removed. Debulking surgery, which is used to remove some but not all of the cancer. Palliative surgery, this is used to correct a problem that is causing discomfort or disability. And reconstructive surgery, which can be used to improve the way a person looks after a major cancer surgery. Radiation therapy, is a cancer treatment that uses high or low doses of radiation to remove cancer cells and shrink tumors. At high doses, radiation therapy can kill cancer cells or slow their growth by damaging their DNA. When the DNA of cancer cells are damaged beyond repair, they stop dividing and die. Radiation is used in a number of ways in cancer treatment but there are two main types of radiation treatment. External beam radiation therapy, which uses a machine that directs high energy rays from outside the body into the tumor 
an internal radiation therapy that uses a source of radiation that is placed inside a patient's body. The radiation source can be a solid or liquid. Chemotherapy uses drugs to kill cancer cells. Surgery and radiation therapy remove, kill, or damage cancer cells in a certain area. But chemotherapy can work throughout the entire body. This allows chemo to effectively kill cancer cells that have metastasized or spread to other parts of the body far away from the original primary tumor. Today, chemotherapy is used in a wide variety of different forms. Some common forms are oral chemotherapy. Here, a patient is given a pill, capsule, or liquid that can be swallowed. It can be given topically and a cream that can be rubbed onto your skin, or most commonly, intravenously, through an IV. Cancer treatments are constantly evolving, which have included two other promising therapies that can be used in cancer treatment. Targeted therapy and immunotherapy. But all cancer treatments have their downfalls. Cancer treatments can come with side effects that include pain, fatigue, and even hair loss. And some cancer treatments may not be as effective for treating a patient's specific type of cancer. My dad, uh, he actually died from pancreatic cancer. Um, I did not find out that he had pancreatic cancer until um, he slipped into a coma and 30 days later he passed away from it. Um, originally, it, it hit itself as being uh, diabetes. So it was undetected for a very long time. I was an adult when he passed. However, you still feel like an orphan when you lose your parent. Um, my children, they were robbed of having a grandfather. My other sisters, they were robbed from having a dad it still affects me to this day. Four years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And um, I would not had anyone in my family that had breast cancer. So uh, it, it came as a real shock, I guess. I'd always seen myself as a very healthy individual. And so to find that you have uh, what can be a life-threatening cancer was uh, a big surprise. Well, it's very interesting how once you get a diagnosis, you're immediately thrown into the cycle of, you know, medical care. And uh, it, it really moves pretty quickly of you're seeing your physician and your physician is sending you to a surgeon and you're meeting with all these individuals and getting advice basically as to how to best treat your particular uh, type of cancer. Cancers, as far as it, it does tend to run in our families. Uh, and I think if you live long enough, you're gonna witness a friend or a family member that's gonna have cancer. So the statistics are alarming. Imagine going from Atlanta to New York City and imagine New York City is cancer. So the path to go from normal cells to a cancer cell can be highly divergent. And there may be specific routes that are preferred routes. And so if we look at different cancers, we'll see some pathways that are recur in different cancers. And that would be analogous to say, going from Atlanta to New York, taking Route 95, which is the main highway going up. But there are many alternative routes to get there. And without having an appreciation of that, integration, it becomes difficult to properly treat the cancer. So if you came up with a drug that would um, inhibit the major pathway you think involved in the cancer, that would be analogous to blowing up Route 95. So if you're somebody who wanted to get to New York City, you know, you're a cancer cell and you want to be growing, somebody can block you in a major route, but eventually you're going to look for alternative pathways to get to where you want to go. And this seems to be the basis of, of the recurrence of many tumors. So even after patients are successfully treated 
with a cancer and you see the cancer shrinking, you get recurrence. And if you look on a molecular level, the basis of that recurrence seems to be that the cancer cells find alternative routes to go around. So what does that mean in terms of getting to a final solution? I think we need to understand the full network of interactions that are going on in cancer and try to come up with rational strategies to not only attack the major pathways, but look for alternative pathways in that particular patient. I think cancer is a, it's a complex disease, very interesting disease, um, but it's something that is almost inevitable as we get older. And maybe we can prolong it, but I don't think it's going to be very difficult to cure it. Finding a complete cure for cancer is a difficult task. With many different types and different makeups for each type, our hope for a cure rests on the discoveries of doctors and cancer researchers. But that doesn't leave us powerless. There is something we can do to level the playing field on cancer. Research from over the last decade has opened the idea that we can lower our chance of getting cancer and also even create well-oiled fighting machines to fight off cancer or the recurrence of cancer. Heart disease is our number one killer. Killer number two is cancer. What happens if you put a cancer on a plant-based diet. Dr. Dean Ornish and colleagues found that the progression of prostate cancer could be reversed with a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors, and no wonder. If you drip the blood of those eating the standard American diet onto uh, cancer cells growing in a petri dish, cancer growth is cut down by about 9%. But put people on a plant-based diet for a year, though, and their blood can do this. The blood circulating throughout the bodies of those eating plant-based diets has nearly eight times the stopping power when it comes to cancer cell growth. Now this is for prostate cancer, the leading cancer killer specific to men and women, it's breast cancer. So they wanted to repeat this study using women and breast cancer cells instead, but look, they didn't want to wait a whole year to get the results. So I said, well, let's see what a plant-based diet can do in just two weeks against three, uh, three lines of human breast cancer cells. Here's the before, uh, cancer cell growth powering, at 100, powering away at 100%. Here's after, just two weeks eating healthy. Here's kind of a before picture. This is a photomicrograph, photograph taken under a microscope. What they did is they laid down a confluent layer like a carpet of, of uh, human breast cancer cells. Um, and then they drip the blood of women eating the standard American diet onto those cells. And as you can see, it kind of breaks up the cancer into these kind of cancer continents here. Um, uh, so even women eating crappy diets aren't totally defenseless. But then they take these same women, put them on a plant-based diet two weeks later, so they act as their own controls. Same women, two weeks later after a plant-based diet, they lay down another layer of breast cancer, and then they drip the blood of the same women two weeks later, and their blood can do this, right? Just a few individual cancer cells left with their bodies cleaned up. Before and after just two weeks eating healthy, their blood became that much more hostile to cancer. What kind of blood do we want in our body? What kind of immune system? Right? Do we want the blood just kind of rolls over when new cancer cells pop up? Or do we want blood circulating to every nook and cranny in our body with the power to slow down and stop? We know that uh, diets that are higher in fruits and vegetables, uh, whole grains, um, low in processed foods, and little to no meat, are generally regarded as healthful diets. Uh, they've been shown to improve conditions like heart disease, uh, diabetes, 
uh, and also uh, limit or slow the progression of, of some cancers. Hippocrates said, you know, let medicine be your food and food be your medicine. And I think that uh, can, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, we eat three or more times a day, most people do, and um, that can add up. We know that the way you eat can change the expression of certain genes in your body, which is, uh, that's what the newest research is saying, and that's really interesting. Um, one of the landmark studies, the China study, uh, done by a researcher, a clinical researcher by the name of T. Colin Campbell, uh, in this research and even a book that is available, show that the casein that is found in cheese and meat, it is the protein, it's, a, it's, it's too much protein. See, the body is designed in such a way that it has nutritional requirements daily. And to, to go above that and give it more than it needs is to actually subject the body to lifestyle diseases, um, or even to give them the micronutrients or vitamins and minerals from a source that the body doesn't need or want also would bring on cancer. So you can actually be preventative in, in this whole approach, health lifestyle approach. But in this, in this particular landmark, landmark study, it showed that um, when a person actually ate casein, it turned on cancer. When they actually took it out of the diet, it turned it off. Now this is something that's called epigenetics, or for, the, for many years we've been sort of describing it as, uh, or putting it in these terms, um, genetics loads the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. They actually took a couple twins. One ate one way, healthy, the other ate a uh, standard American diet, and they basically looked at what their health was like after a period of time, and we saw that the person who ate the healthy diet it was fine, and gen genetically they were almost identical, pretty much identical, right? Um, but the one who had a standard American diet actually began to take on all of the lifestyle diseases. So this is a scientific fact. This is not, you know, an opinion. If we eat a certain way, live a certain way, we will come down with lifestyle diseases, and worst of all, in, in a lot of cases, cancer. I'll tell you a story you'll never forget A story about you and your cigarette Enjoy smoother smoking, choose wisely, choose well Smoke longer and finer and milder Pell-Mell 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 Smoke longer and finer and milder Pell-Mell Reward yourself with the pleasure of smooth smoking Pell-Mell's greater... In the 19th century, smoking was known as something healthy by the mid-1950s, it was said that almost half the adult population in the United States smoked cigarettes. But medical professionals at that time began to see a link between smoking and disease. As air passed from the cigarette to the lungs, it impaired the lungs, harming healthy cells and injuring the important organs of the body. With the public beginning to question its safety, in 1952, the Reader's Digest published Cancer by the Carton, an article that detailed the dangers of smoking. Similar reports began appearing in other periodicals, and in 1964, the Surgeon General, with assistance from his advisory committee, released a 387-page report that suggested a link between smoking and cancer. By 1965, Congress passed the Federal Cigarette Labeling and Advertising Act, requiring the Surgeon General's warning to be posted on all cigarette packages. In 1971, all broadcast advertising was banned. By 1990, smoking was banned on all interstate, buses, and domestic air flights, lasting six hours or less. And in 1995,
President Clinton announced the Food and Drug Administration's plan to regulate tobacco, especially sales and advertising aimed at minors. The public can lead on change. The same way the public impacted smoking is the same way we, the public, can impact cancer by our diet and lifestyle. I think that, again, you can, is aging connected with lifestyle? And you can see that people that maintain their diet, exercise programs are much more vigorous in later years than people that do not. I think all of these things are connected. And so I think by analogy, somebody who um, is more concerned with keep, that the diet they eat and so forth, there's gonna be much more vigorous it's more likely their immune system will remain stronger and other repair systems that would counteract the effects of cancer. I think there's a strong relationship there uh, between preventing cancer and living a healthier lifestyle. I mean, a lot of cancer specialists that I've spoken to have said that, yeah, lifestyle is a big factor in, in the development of cancer. So if you can establish a, a lifestyle that's, that's uh, lots of uh, pure, pure air, pure water, uh, unadulterated food, vegetables, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, things like that. I think it goes even further. I think we can say positive relationships with other people, um, you know, a spiritual connection, uh, just balanced emotional states as well. I think those are all things that, c that contribute to overall health and have even been shown to help support uh, healthy immune function. Cancer just means to me, I, I, I wanted to say that it, it means something that we all need to be aware of because it does not discriminate who it affects. Children, adults, teenagers, everybody, no matter at your ethnicity, your nationality, your religion, it impacts every single one of us. So we need to think of it in global terms and in terms of finding a cure in all of our lifetime. Eating bad food is not the only factor that causes cancer. I mean, environmentally, um, there is some sort of genetic link. Um, however, even with the genetic link, what we eat and how the environment and how we live, even how we think, might, might be a contributing factor to those cancer cells and even that genetic disposition expressing itself. We really are what we eat. We really, you know, and it's, you know, nutrition is important, nutrition is essential. It's not, illness is not a luck of the draw. There is, I mean, it might not be your fault. It's your responsibility, but it's not your fault because a lot of things we don't have control over, like we don't have control over necessarily the air that we breathe at this time or so on. But the things that we do have control over, I think we should take it seriously and try to do our best.
sunshine in all you do. Thank you. 